Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Psychology Podcast. I am your host, Daniel Karim. In my podcast, I interview extraordinary people and pick their brains. Each episode will feature a guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a different perspective on the many paths that can lead to a rich and fulfilled life. This includes their favorite books, morning routines, exercise habits, trade secrets, nutritional philosophies, and their overall take on happiness and success. My goal is to find out where those amazing people get their holistic results from so that you and I can use their tactics and go kick ass in life as well. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy today's episode. Jeffrey, this is Daniel. Nice to meet you. Hi, Daniel. Nice to meet you too. How are you today? Good, good. I want to introduce, yeah. to you, uh, introduce myself to you first. I'm a, a psychology student and blogger. Uh huh. I created my podcast because, uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty fun to talk to people like you and learn something and at the same time give something to my audience back and that I believe is of value. And I spent the last uh, two days excessively studying your stuff. And Jeffrey, from when you responded to that email, you should have seen my face because give, given to know how much you have on your plate and I'm currently also in the process of writing my first book and I'm like, am I totally overwhelmed and I feel like I don't have enough time for anything. And so the very fact that you take, took some time off your busy schedule really means a lot. And uh, yeah, it, it, it's more than I hope for. Okay. So what would you like to know? Okay. If people ask you what you do, what would you say to them? Well, it depends which people would ask if, um, like I have two little granddaughters who are three and six and when they, well, my job is different now because now I work in, uh, in a medical school in the hospital, but they ask me, Poppy, what do you do when you go to work? And what I tell them is that, um, I do the same thing that I do with you. I, I tell them stories and I listen to people carefully. And when they tell me, um, what's bothering them, you know, I, I, I listen to them and I try to help them figure out what's wrong. So in the mind of a three-year-old or a six-year-old, you know, that's kind of the simplest version of, of, of what I do. But Daniel, I do so many different things that it's kind of hard to, I'm not even sure what my identity is, but in the last, um, I guess I'll say this in the, maybe this is more than you wanted to know, but, um, no, no, keep few, going. <laughs> Okay. Well, two years ago, um, I was still, you know, teaching psychotherapy in California. And um, most of what I've been doing the last, you know, 20 years is working uh, with children, like in remote parts of the world, who are at greatest jeopardy, like the project I have in Nepal. Um, and when Two year and two years ago, I was three years ago. I was working in Nepal during the earthquakes um, and uh, with a trauma team, and became uh, quite traumatized myself by the horrible things I saw and all the dead bodies and everything. And um, plus, I probably contracted some major infection. But I came back and I became really sick and really depressed and. Um, that was about the time that Trump was elected president. And um, I still, I, I became so profoundly depressed. I could barely get out of bed. It felt like, you know, my country and the world was tilting off its kilter. It felt like um, all the things that I think are most important, you know, are being, um, no, you know, half my country elects this idiot that's, you know, can't even put a, a sentence together and is so obviously racist and so uh, concerned only for other billionaires. And it's just like an idiot. And I became so depressed that I quit my job and moved here to Houston, where I live now, where my granddaughters live, um, in order to, to train people to work with refugees, you know, and to work with immigrants. So a lot, to answer your question, a lot of what I do is driven by kind of saving myself as much as trying to save other, you know, other people. And it, to me, it felt like the only way I could fight Trump, um, the only way I could save myself and, and deal with my own depression was to fight back. And so that's kind of 
that's what I do now. But um, it's it's a complicated, you know, I'm writing five books right now, or I'm supervising psychiatrists right now, or I'm, um, you know, traveling around the world, giving keynote speeches and conferences, or so I do a lot of things. But it, my primary identity is probably the first thing that I said, which is I'm a storyteller that, you know, that's what I did. And if you notice the way I just answered your question was with a story, uh, it was with a very personal story. And um, thank you so much for sharing that. And this was one of the reasons why I wanted to talk um, to you was because um, I became a psychology student because from a very early age, I was always the person who my parents came to me to talk about their problems. So I always had this bit of a therapeutic role early in my life. And I heard an interview of yourself saying that you very, from a very, very early age started being the mediator for your, for your parents and your family. And like the idea behind me to me is very like the equivalent of a professional boxer who starts <laughs> learning to box at the age of six for something. So I want to ask you what motivated you to become a therapist? Um, that a therapist helped me that, um, I think, uh, my girlfriend, I was in, uh, my first year of university and my girlfriend broke up with me and, um, I, you know, was really struggling and lost. And there was a psychologist at the counseling center on campus and I went to see her and, um, she was profoundly helpful to me. And I just thought, what a cool job you know, that you get to listen to people and, and help them. And I felt, you know, pretty powerless and um, at that stage in my life. So I felt like, wow, that maybe that's a way that I could feel okay about myself if I can, if I can help others. And, you know, to this day, you know, I, I don't feel good about myself before I go to sleep if I don't do two things. And, One is, did I work out? You know, I have to work out every day physically, you know, to run or go to the gym or um, do a cycling class or something. And if I don't, I don't feel good about myself. And the second thing is, who did I help today? You know, so, you know, you might wonder if, I, you know, I'm so busy and so important and I got all this stuff doing, why would I deliberately take a half hour out of my morning in the middle of my coffee to talk to you? I wanted to ask you this. It's like... Uh... Oh my God, like what motivated you to, to help me out here? Because there's clearly like much more value for me here from being teached by you than the other way. But why would I do it too? What, you know, what does it do for me? And the answer is that um, that's what helps me to feel worthwhile. You know, that's what makes a difference in my life that I, that I did something for someone else. And I just, that's like the guiding force in my life. That's beautiful. Um, one of my favorite sentences from you is that you described, uh, I wanted to talk to you because when you talked about the joy that for you comes out with being a therapist and with studying psychology is that you can live the life of a thousand lives of, of a thousand people. And I thought that was beautiful because I feel the same way that uh, the idea that somebody pays me to do psychology stuff is absurd to me because I would do it. I'm doing it for free anyway. And I wanted to ask you, what is your personal definition of a therapist? Well, it, it's hard to answer because the term is defined legally, you know, in, in different jurisdictions, in different parts of the world, in different, you know, in the United States and every state has a different kind of license. I was more meaning that like uh, your definition of it. What, what do you see your mission by it, you know? Well, I guess the question you're asking is what do I believe it is about psychotherapy that's helpful to people? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I think it's, um, well, there's a lot of research on this and we know that about 60% of somewhere around 60% of the positive or successful outcomes that occur from psychotherapy result from the client or the patient's perception of the quality of the relationship. So when we hang up from this call, if you felt 
heard by me and understood by me and respected by me, whether I did or not, you know, it, it, it isn't important whether I think that we had a good relationship. All that matters is when you hang up, if you think we had a good connection today, then 60% of whatever we do, um, you will see that, wow, this was really a, a good interview. Now, that's only 60%. You know, that's a good start, but it has to include other things, meaning hopefully it, I say something that's useful or, you know, that sounds smart to you or wise or something you didn't know. So um, we could feel a strong connection. But if I don't say anything to you that you never heard before, then, oh, well, that felt good, but I didn't really learn anything. So but I, the bottom line is relational engage. The client's perception of relational engagement is the most important thing, followed by, um, you know, listening and honoring the person's story. Talk isn't really enough. Helping people to convert the insights or the understanding or the talk into some specific action, because one of the ways that psychotherapy isn't very helpful is some people come and show up and talk a good game, but then they walk out the door and don't really change anything. So ultimately, you know, the the measure of success is what are you doing? You know, how did how did this conversation truly change you? You know, what are you doing differently in your life? Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I'm myself in therapy and now I, I think I suck at it <laughs> <laughs> because I don't know if you noticed, but if you, I'm very obsessive about psychology and I pretty much do nothing else but learn and collect stories from people. And oftentimes you, I, I realize about myself that I'm not a very good patient because I try to lead uh, the therapy session. And I wanted to ask you for advice. What is a way to become a good patient and or a good client and to get the most out, most out of therapy? I don't know which edition of the book I'm being a therapist you have, but in the latest edition that was published, the one that was published by Oxford University Press, there's I added another chapter that's called How to Be a Patient, How to Be a, a Good Client in Therapy. Um, because the question you're asking is, you know, it's a good one. Um, I, you know, I think it's who you pick as your therapist. You know, you, you don't lead you don't lead somebody that you trust knows more than you do and knows what the hell they're doing. You know, like I surrender to people that know more than, than I do. And if I find myself um, pushing back or trying to not follow where they're leading, it's because I don't really trust the direction that we're going in. <laughs> so um, when I have in my life, when I found a mentor, um, or a supervisor or a teacher, somebody that I trust or that I really admire, then I'm along for the ride, you know, like show me what you want to show me, take me where you want to take me. And when it gets to a point that I don't want to go there anymore, or I think we're going to the wrong place, then I think it's time to find a new therapist or mentor. Yeah, I agree. And which are some of your mentors that had a big impact on your life? And I know there must be many, many, many. So maybe you share a story of one of them or two of them. Um, you know, I would say I had two really, really influential mentors. One was, um, I, you know, I was not a good student in high school and I had a lot of problems in high school and um, socially, academically, vision wise. Um, I was a terrible student and um, I couldn't really even get into university anywhere. Um because my grades were so bad and I, I don't score well on standardized tests. So I couldn't, I couldn't even get into university anywhere. And I find one small university near my home um, allowed me in on probation for one semester. And um, so it was my very first semester in college and I had a psychology class and in which we were supposed to write a story every week and turn in a story. And, you know, I would turn in my stories. They were like wild kinds of things. And the professor, the instructor loved them. 
you know, and I, I got an A plus on my, and I, and, you know, I didn't know I could, I could write. I, I honestly didn't know I could do that. But this first professor I ever had my first semester kind of realized that I was a really good writer and it was something I didn't know about myself. And, um, that had a profound effect. And then a similar thing happened. It's really hard to get into graduate school in psychology. I had the same problem. I don't test well on standardized tests. My grades were okay, but they weren't extraordinary. I couldn't get into a graduate program in psychology. Same exact scenario happened. I just realized I applied all over the world to, to universities, to maybe 50 universities. You know how much that costs, you know? And I didn't get into any. And finally, there was a local university in my, in my city, which wasn't in psychology, it was in counseling. And I didn't even know what counseling was, you know. I, um, and, but in those days, it was working as a school counselor, you know, to help kids with developmental problems. And they didn't ask for standardized tests. And you didn't need a high grade point average to get in. <laughs> so I talked my way into this program, too. And again, my first semester, I had a professor who um, assigned this paper to write. I don't even remember what it was called. But I'm kind of embarrassed to say this, but I wrote a 70-page single-space uh, single paper. Oh, the it was called My Behavior in Groups. And you were supposed to write a paper about to anal analyze your paper in groups, analyze your own behavior in groups. And I wrote this 70 page single space paper that was supposed to be 10 pages double spaced. And um, and the professor went wild, you know, not um, punishing me, but calling me into his office and saying, I want you to get involved in a research project with me. So. And this second professor became my mentor for about the next uh, five years, um, long after I graduated. And again, I couldn't get into a Ph.D. program when I graduated from my master's program. And he called up one of his friends and said, I have this amazing student. You have to accept this student into your program. And then he became my mentor. And so, um, yeah, though. uh I guess that's why I take my role seriously about, you know, helping others because people help me. That was beautiful. This was one of the reasons why I created this podcast because I'm from Germany and I don't have the money to go to all the fancy universities in America. And I thought that maybe some of or some of the professors would uh, reply to my mails and yeah, but here, here but we still, are. Yeah, you got to go to graduate school. If you want <laughs> people to take you seriously. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's true. Um, I have one more question. Um, I heard you say that your clients were some of your biggest teachers. Any story that comes to mind where a patient or where a person that you met on your adventures uh, changed you for the better or teach you something important? Well, like, how about right now? Like, why don't we take talk about what's happening right this moment? So you've all already shared uh, a part of your story. Um, and Daniel, like, I, I know next to nothing about you. Like, I don't know who you are, or where you are, or what your plans are, or what you're doing, or why you write a blog, or what you're after. I, I don't know anything. You know, all I know is you have a nice smile and... <laughs> And I like to reward people that take risks, you know, that so. So when we hang up, like my takeaway from or one of my takeaways from this conversation is how a resourceful, assertive young person without status and prestige and advanced degrees and a long list of books can with initiative and with courage and um and with resilience because more often than not when you reach out to people they're going to say no i'm too busy you know or who the fuck are you you know like i'm a busy important person i don't have time to talk to you um so my takeaway from this conversation if you're my client in this moment is like once again i guess i see um 
that part of myself in you. I, I re, I'm working on an introduction to psychology textbook right now. And um, I've been writing about, um, you know, learning the chapter on learning, which is really boring. Um, but I remembered in the book I just wrote yesterday, I wrote a story about um, when I took a psychology class on learning theory, one of the questions was, uh, there was a take home exam. And it was, do you remember who BF Skinner is in operant conditioning? Yep. Yeah. So it was, um, what is BF Skinner's theory of forgetting? And um, it was a take home exam. And I, you know, I like, I looked in my book and I, I didn't see why wow, I don't see a, a theory of forgetting that he has. So he was Skinner was still alive in those days and um, he was at Harvard University. So I called information. This was before the Internet. So I called information in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and B.F. Skinner was listed in the phone book. <laughs> so so I, I called him on the phone and um you know, and this woman answered the phone and I said, I didn't even know what his first name is. I don't even think I said Dr. Skinner. I said, is, is BF there? You know, I don't know what they call them. And, um, and the person who answered the phone said, no, I'm so sorry, sir. He's not at home. And I said, well, who are you? And he said, well, I'm the housekeeper. And I said, well, do you know what BF's theory of forgetting is? And she said, no, sir, I'm sorry. I don't. And she hung up the phone. So, in my answer to the question on the exam, I related this story. And I didn't really, I didn't realize at the time that Skinner's theory of forgetting is actually called extinction. It's not, he didn't believe you forget something. He believed that if it's not reinforced, it becomes extinguished. That was the right answer. But instead I just told the story of calling and I got an A on the, on the exam. <laughs> Because the professor thought that was so cool that I thought to do that. So, um, yeah, that's what I that's my takeaway from our conversation <laughs> about if you don't reach out to people, that good things don't happen. How does it feel that there's a guy on the other side of the world and I don't play this like this is that level of exciting for me. I couldn't do anything else today. I, I was sweating heavily. I was just excited with, with, with pure joy. What it feels like to, to be on the other side of the spectrum now, that you, you are the mentor now in some way. You know, it, it feels good, but it mostly feels terrifying. That um, it's, it's scary to have so much power. Um, it's scary to think, you know, given the amount of power that you give me, um, what if I said or did something that you found disrespectful or that you found hurtful? Or, I mean, I just, um, I inadvertently, um, you know, I've been talking to students for a long time. And when students ask a question in class, um, they tell me that I have this blank look on my face when I'm thinking about their question. And students report to me how how scary I am that they often feel judged by me. You know, that they ask a question and then I have my thinking face on and they feel ashamed because they read my face and think I'm saying to myself, what a stupid question, or I really don't like this student at all. And that's not what I'm thinking at all. I'm just thinking about their question. But when somebody has a lot of power than, than a misplaced look or um, a joke that I make or something I say or an expression the other person can feel is, is really hurtful. So I'm, I'm very concerned about that and, and scared, you know, that I might say or do something that someone else finds offensive. And that's highly probable that's going to happen because I'm very provocative and I'm very honest and I'm very open. And I, I say shit all the time, you know, that, um, that is, you know, direct, like once again, I don't know who you are. I don't know what your politics are. I mean, there's some scary politics going on in Germany right now that parallel what's going on in the U S and, as I was saying what I was saying, I thought, well, like, what if you're like a big Brexit supporter and a big, you know, what if you're a neo-Nazi dude, you know, or <laughs> but, um, yeah. like, seriously, I, mm. you know, that um, I'm Jewish. I had family members killed in concentration camps. So, mm. um, 
so I don't know anything about you. And, you know, I blurted out before I know anything, all kinds of, of personal things that, you know, you have a blank look on your face, but you know, how do I know what, what you're thinking? So I, I'm scared by the power that, um, I, I, of course I like it. If I didn't like it, I wouldn't work so hard to get it. Come on. Um, but it's a, a double edged sword. But I think it also shows how reflective you are and how visible to you the connection between student and yourself is. And I think a lot of people don't, and don't have that in a way. And it's, it's crazy to me that, them, them, that you have such a natural trust for people in a way that you don't assume the worst, but that you just give it a try. Yeah, it, sometimes it doesn't, you know, sometimes it doesn't work out. But I, I guess, Daniel, the, the last thing I'll say, and, it, you know, if you've read some of my stuff, you know, this is like a really important theme about um, how the greatest responsibility to me of a psychologist or a teacher or a coach or a mentor or a blogger or a writer is um, to be who we wish other people to be. You know, the, the hypocrisy, um, you know, really bothers me. And I, um, in my country, you know, like what's going on right now is, is absolutely insane. And the, you know, if we talk about leadership, you know, regardless of politics, you know, whether you're conservative or liberal, whether you believe in immigration or you don't believe in immigration, whether um, in my country, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or whatever, I, I think that what I'm so ashamed of and so bothered by related to my current president, or he's not my president, our, the president of our country, is the man can't put a sentence together. You know, like he's not bright and he's not compassionate and he's not caring. He's not articulate. Um, he uh, is clearly racist towards other people. He, the dude's a clown, you know, he, he's a bully and he calls people names and he, I mean, it's like, it's, it's embarrassing that this person is in a position of leadership and that's what bothers me. And in our previous president, Obama, you know, regardless of whether you agreed with his, his politics or whether you liked him or whether you, you agreed with his policies, he read books and he was articulate and he was poetic and he cared about people and the way he treated his own children and, and his, his love affair with his own wife. And like, these are all the qualities and characteristics, um, you know, th that I admire. And I don't know that much about German politics, but I like Merkel. I, you know, I, I know that, you know, she's lost a lot of popularity, but she's a strong, powerful woman. And, and even if, I didn't believe in, in some of her policies, which I don't, I admire and respect the person, you know, like she's, I like what she shows little girls and, and I have two little granddaughters and I want them to see powerful women, you know, that kick ass and take names and, and try to do good things for their people. So that's, what's most important to me in life, whether you're a parent or a teacher, whatever you do that, You don't just talk a good game, but that you walk your talk. You you apply in your own life what you say is important for others. And I guess the last thing I should say is because I'm so stupid and clueless about German politics and whatever, um, I hope any of your readers or listeners forgive me for saying anything that was stupid. <laughs> um, but I'm just an American. Yeah. Um, Jeffrey, can I ask you two more questions before we shut up? Yeah, let's be brief, though. Let's yeah. be brief. Um, I have one question that I have to ask you because I totally couldn't get my, my head around this. Yeah. It is about your time in Nepal with the, the, tra the trauma team. I yeah. don't know if you want to talk about it, but just the sheer number of people you treated there. Could you, could you tell a story about that and how you developed the necessary resilience habits for you to make a sense of all this mess? Because... I certainly couldn't do it. Well, you know, there are there are 400 girls there who I've known for 20 years, you know, and who I've mentored and supported and, you know, gotten scholarships for. So I've been going there for 20 years. 
And so when the world fell apart and all these people were dying, um, you know, I was getting um, a lot of the girls that we support are on Facebook and I would, you know, was getting all these messages from them about, um, you know, I don't know where my house is. I don't know where my parents are. You know, my leg is broken. What should I do? Where should I go? There's no water. There's no food. You know, people are dying everywhere. Um, so, you know, within hours, you know, I hopped on a plane. Um, and well, not hours, it was a couple days. And um, to make sure that children were okay and to, to, you know, to do, you know, to do what I what I could to help. And the other thing is that my collaborator and partner in this project, um, who's from Iran originally, Sarah, um, had been climbing Mount Everest to, um, to plant the flag of our foundation on top of the highest place in the world to show these girls, this is what a powerful woman can do. You know, because Nepal is a place where girls and women don't have many rights. And they're exploited and they're trafficked into sex slavery. And Sarah wanted to show them, look what a, you know, I look like you and look what a woman can do. And when the earthquake hit, she was in the Kumbu ice fall and um, where all the people died and it took a week to rescue her. And she was calling me by satellite phone, um, you know, to say goodbye, you know, that there's, she was at camp two and, um, you know, which is above 21, what is that in meters? Well, it's above 7,000 meters and, um, there's no way anyone could rescue her. So she was calling to say goodbye. And, um, it took about four or five days before a helicopter could get up that high to, to rescue the survivors. But, um, Sarah and I wrote, you know, like everything in my life, we wrote a, a book about this, which is now being made into a movie. Um, but it, uh, I, I, um, I thrive on adventure. You know, I, I love taking risks. I love doing new things. Um, I'm trying to figure out a way to go with a friend to Sierra Leone in Cent in Africa, um, because in the whole country they only have one mental health professional. <laughs> And, um, you know, with Ebola and all the uh, civil wars and uh, genocide that has occurred there, it seems to me that's a, a good place to go next to, to make a difference. And I just want to do as much as I can, you know, before I before I croak and I'm uh, I'm not a young person, so I don't know how much time I have left. So I, I want to do as much as I can. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. As a, what three things would you advise me to put on my bucket list as a young traveler and psychology obsessed guy? What adventures, psychiatries or uh, university witchcraft villages where you have been to, would you recommend me check out on my journey of becoming? Well, my answer Daniel, isn't what you probably expect because you think I'm going to mention something really exotic. And, um, and yeah, I've lived in, you know, I've worked in probably nine or 10 different countries and pretty exotic, you know, seal hunting village in Greenland or, um, you know, I've been caught in a civil war in, in Nepal, you know, all those sound like exotic stories, but it seems to me not knowing you very well, what you need the most, if you want to make your mark, is you need some more academic credentials. So you need to go to graduate school. You really do. And it, it I don't, you know, I, I think it's important not to allow other people to tell you what you're not allowed to do. You know, I can't, my first book that I wanted to get published, and this was way before Amazon and self-publishing, um, is I got 50 rejection letters from publishers and I wallpapered a room with the rejection letters. I mean, I literally took paste and I had the whole wall of a room wallpapered with rejection letters from publishers because I was so proud that I wouldn't take no for an answer that, and you know, that I just kept trying and trying and trying. So the adventure that you need to be taken really seriously not just by 
random people that read your blog or followers, but I mean other psychologists and other experts in the world, is you need academic credentials to be taken seriously. Unfortunately, that's the way the world works. So I think that's the adventure you need next. Exciting, exciting news. Jeffrey, I have uh, taken more time of you than I was planning to do. A 10 second question than we are. If you could put a life slogan on every mug in the world, what would that slogan be? So a message for everybody to see from you. Be who you want other people to be. Jeffrey, I thank you so much for your time. I don't want to steal more of it. And this was very important to me. And yeah, I'm eager to do things now. So I'm expecting big things from you, Daniel. Uh, you will hear from me again. Have a beautiful day. Thank you so much for the interview. Bye bye. Bye. Well, folks, this was today's episode. I hope this could add some value to you guys. This podcast still is in its experimental phase. So please let me know what you liked and didn't like. You can let me know on my blog dannykareem.com or on social media. As always, thank you so much for listening and tune in next time.